Part 4, Tilden Potter Subcommittee Testimony Tilden, the object is to impute to me some failure of duty. If I answer that question, I propose to answer it fully, I propose to raise the standard as high as I can, and we will see whether the other gentlemen adopt it. Hiskek, it seems to me that, in this examination, the true way to answer a question is to answer it, so far as you can, directly, and not to seek to answer it by assailing anyone else. Dilden I do not desire to assail anybody, but when a sublimated standard of morals is set up, I propose to analyze it and to see whether the party that set it up stands up to it. Hiskek, well, now I will call your attention to another answer you have made here. You have said that if you had entertained any idea, I am giving your idea as conveyed by your answer, and not your words, that if you had conceived the idea of influencing these boards venally, or by venal considerations, the last person in the world that you would have chosen for that mission would have been Colonel Pelton. Now I ask you to bear that answer in mind for a moment, and then to state why, after you learned of his visit to Baltimore, you did not deem it proper, and perhaps your duty, to call the attention of Edward Cooper or of Hewitt, both of them distinguished and very able men, to the fact that they must take charge of this matter, that Colonel Pelton must be left out of the correspondence, and that they must give it their personal attention, lest you and the Democratic Party should be embarrassed, and perhaps scandalized, by the action of Colonel Pelton. Tilden, in the first place, I suppose that those gentlemen were giving it their personal attention. Those gentlemen had the real power, and Pelton had not, they were able to supervise and control it whenever they chose. Cooper, in particular, had custody of the money, without which Pelton could not involve the committee in the expenditure of a cent. In the next place, Cooper was the gentleman from whom I derived my information of what was done in Baltimore, and from him exclusively. Hewitt was his brother-in-law. I did not think that they needed any warning on the subject. In the third place, I regarded the Baltimore thing as very foolish and very wrong, but still as an inchoate transaction. By my intervention it was stopped while there was a locus penitentia. Now, the civil law does not recognize purpose until they embody themselves in action, the church punishes those purposes merely as sinful thoughts. Pelton had not, so far as I knew, done anything except to receive a proposition from a set of Republican electors to sell the certificates. There was no consummation of the plan, the thing perished in embryo, and it did not strike me as being of such enormous importance as it would, had there been any possibility of the thing succeeding, or of any similar transaction succeeding. I say this without meaning in the least to excuse Pelton, for I do not mean to excuse him. The atmosphere at that time was filled with rumors and assertions of the venality and fraud of these returning boards in those three states and of their offers. Tilden slams his fist down hard on the desk. I declare before God and my country that it is my entire belief that the votes and certificates of Florida and Louisiana were bought and that the presidency was controlled by their purchase. Tilden, Pelton, seeing that condition of things, committed a fault, he committed an error, he committed a wrong, he adopted the idea that it was justifiable to fight fire with fire, he adopted the idea, when he saw the presidency being taken away from the man who had been elected by the people and according to the law and the fact, that it was legitimate to defeat the crime by the means he took, he was inexcusable. I adopted an entirely different system, an entirely different code of ethics. I scorned to defend my righteous title by such means as were employed to acquire a felonious possession. Pelton did not act rightly. He may be tried, he may be condemned, public opinion may punish him. At the same time, even that fault is to be judged according to the facts, according to the times, according to what was being done and what was done. His act was an inchoate offense. On the other side, the act that was done was a completed and consummated offense, it built up a possession of the presidency of the United States in the man who was not elected. And the representatives and champions of that condition of things are the men whose consciences are troubled with the inchoate wrongdoing of Pelton, which I stopped and crushed out in the bud. Hiskek, now, Governor, you will state upon what information you based that belief, 
and in giving your information you will please give the name of the party communicating it to you. Tilden, I have no private information on the subject, I believe it on evidence before this committee, which is accessible to the public. Hiskek, do you mean to say that there is any evidence before this committee that either of these returning boards was bought? Tilden, I think so. Hiskek, will you do me the kindness to point out the witnesses who testified to it, and the evidence to that effect? Tilden, McClin testified that he held the casting vote of the state of Florida, he testified that he gave a false certificate, contrary to fact, and contrary to law. The whole matter is in a nutshell and easily discovered. Hiskek, you are mistaken, McClin has sworn nothing of the kind. Tilden, I think I am not mistaken. McClin said further that his mind was probably influenced by the promise of office. He was immediately afterward appointed to a judgeship in New Mexico, and Noyes, who was down there, but did not stop the transaction, was appointed to minister to Paris. Hiskek, are you entirely clear that McClin swore that he was influenced by the hope of being appointed to office? Tilden, I think he said so. Hiskek, do you swear that he said so? Tilden, I swear that it is my recollection that he substantially said so. Have you the record? That will show. The committee refers to the record. Now, gentlemen, I believe that I am competent to be the custodian of my own honor. I do not think that my virtue is of so delicate a texture that it needs that I should practice any brutality toward anybody. I may err in judgment or in conduct, but I think that in all my dealings with Pelton I have been able, and shall be able, to do about what is right, to protect everybody from any wrong so far as I have any control and at the same time to be just. You have been pursuing a course of examination, the object of which was to ascribe to me some failure of duty, and you have intruded yourself into my domestic and family relations. Hiskek, if you had any information at that time that either the returning board of South Carolina or the returning board in Florida was being corrupted by the Republicans, or being influenced in their official action by venal considerations, you will state from whom you received that information. Tilden, I had no personal information. Hiskek, you cannot give me the name of any man? Tilden, no, I stated my belief, and I stated on evidence, that, in my judgment, would convict anybody before a common jury. Hiskek, you stated upon evidence, as I understand you, that would convict anyone before a common jury. Will you give me now again the name of the person who conveyed that evidence to you? Tilden, the evidence is public. Hiskek, oh, it is public. Then you mean to say that you have made that serious charge against these returning boards upon what you saw in the papers and upon public rumor? Tilden, no, not upon public rumor. Hiskek, upon what you saw in the papers? Tilden, I make that charge upon the fact and evidence before your committee and other committees. Hiskek, now I ask you again to give me any evidence which you had that those boards were being corrupted by the Republicans, outside of rumors that you heard on the street or assertions which you saw in the newspapers? Tilden, those two boards did not act until two weeks afterward. Hiskek, no, they did not, but I said about the time. Tilden, they had not made their decision or given their certificate. Hiskek, very well, I will accept that as the fact. I will make my question more specific than that. Up to the time of the final announcement of the decision by those two boards respectively, please communicate to this board any evidence which you have that they were corruptly influenced by Republicans, besides the rumors which you heard in the streets and the facts which you saw alleged in the newspapers. Tilden, you will find it in the field committee. Hiskek, I am not speaking of that time, I am not speaking of so late a period as the field committee. I am limiting you to the time of their final action. Tilden, that is, up to the 6th of December? Hiskek, yes, we are not after any congressional investigation. That will speak for itself. Tilden, I have no proof up to that time. Hiskek, you have no evidence up to December 6, 1876. Have you any evidence except what you saw in the newspapers? Did you see any evidence except what you saw in the newspapers? 
Tilden, I did not personally. Hiskek, do you know of anybody who did have at that time any evidence? And if so, give his name. Tilden, the testimony before the field committee discloses. Hiskek, so that all that you know of it you subsequently learned by the investigation before the field committee? Then, as I understand it, at the time when Colonel Pelton went to Baltimore for the purpose if hearing a proposition on the part of the returning board of South Carolina to sell themselves or to give a certificate to the Tilden electors of that state, up to that time you had no information except the rumors which you saw in the newspapers that they were being venally influenced by Republicans? Tilden, I had no proof. Hiskek, you had no evidence except what you saw in the newspapers? That is my question. Did you have anything except what you saw in the newspapers? Tilden, up to the 6th of December? Hiskek, yes sir. Tilden, I do not think that I had. Hiskek, then you had nothing except newspaper reports at the time when Pelton went there for that purpose? Then in your mind you must withdraw, as a justification for Pelton's conduct at that time, the statement that he was ransoming goods from thieves, or that he was fighting fire with fire? Tilden, I did not say that he was justified, but that he thought he was. Hiskek, and that was predicted upon rumors in the newspapers? Tilden, he was perhaps acting upon a belief in his own mind which subsequently proved to be true. I did not say that I defended his position. Hiskek, I did not understand you to say that you defended his position, but I understood in part your answer to be an apology for his position? Tilden, no, an alleviation. Hiskek, my word was, apology. Chairman Hunton to Hiskek, the only difference about that is that he is testifying and you are not. Tilden, continuing, the danger of tolerating a wrong on either side is its tendency to grow. One man does a thing because another man does it. By action and reaction abuses and wrongs grow until they become a common practice. That was one of the reasons that impelled me to put my foot down against every approach to anything of this kind. Hiskek, now I desire to call your attention to one other dispatch in this case, which came from Marble. It is on page 17, number 34, addressed to Colonel Pelton, number 15 Gramercy Park. Woolley asks me to say, let forces be got together immediately, in readiness for contingencies either here or in Louisiana. Why do you not answer? Did you ever see that dispatch before it was published? Tilden, I never did. Hiskek, of that are you clear? Tilden, positive. Hiskek, if you had seen it, the phrase let forces be got together immediately for contingencies either here or in Louisiana would have attracted your attention? Tilden, it might have done so. Hiskek, have you any doubt that it would? Tilden, I do not understand what it means. Hiskek, I will ask you this question in that connection, if you know or have heard that about that time any considerable sum of money was raised by anybody connected with the National Democratic Committee? Tilden, I have not. Hiskek, have you known, or have you leaned since, that at any time after the election any considerable sum of money was raised by any Democratic parties here in the city of New York or elsewhere which might be used in those states for political purposes? Tilden, of that I have no personal knowledge. Hiskek, have you ever heard so? Tilden, I cannot say that I have. Hiskek, has any communication of that kind been made to you ever? that any considerable sum of money was raised by Democratic parties which might be used for political purposes? I am now speaking of the time after the election was over. Springer, are you referring to the dispatches developed in the Tribune? Hiskek, I have said distinctly, after the election was over. Tilden, I cannot undertake to say, because the committee may have been in debt. Hiskek, I speak with reference to money which was raised by any one. Tilden, I think the committee was pretty largely in debt. Hiskek, you think it was in debt? Is that what I understand you to say? Tilden, yes, I think it was more or less in debt for a year. Hiskek, my question was, whether you knew of any monies having been raised which might have been used in those states? Tilden, I do not. 
hiskek, or of any monies having been raised during the period of time when this correspondence was going on. Tilden, I cannot say whether that was so or not, I cannot tell you. Hiskek, does that mean to imply that you have heard something of the kind? Tilden, it means I did not keep track of the committee. Hiskek, will you be kind enough to look on page 28 of the Tribune Extra number? 44. The last telegram here you will see if from Denmark, Pelton, to Smith Weed, last telegram here. There is undoubtedly good ground, upon which favorable decision could be had, but to be consistent and sustainable, it would and should involve electing Hampton, or else it would be involved in inconsistencies impossible to sustain. Tilden, well? Hiskek, did you ever see that telegram? Tilden, I never did. Hiskek, that sentence that I have read to you is rather in the nature of a legal opinion, is it not? Tilden, it appears to be. Hiskek, did you ever communicate that legal opinion to Colonel Pelton? Tilden, I don't think I did. Hiskek, do you not think you did? Is that as strong as you want to put it? I call your attention to the fact that you simply say, I don't think I did. Tilden, I have no recollection or belief that I did. Hiskek, do you know with whom Colonel Pelton did advise as to legal questions of that sort? Tilden, I do not. Hiskek, did he ever advise with you as to these legal questions? Tilden, I have no recollection of his ever doing it. Hiskek, you knew all this time that Colonel Pelton was in direct communication with these gentlemen, did you not? Tilden, what time? What gentlemen? Hiskek, at the time with these gentlemen in Florida and South Carolina. Tilden, I do not think that I knew he was in any special communication with them. Hiskek, did you not know he was receiving numerous telegrams from the visiting statesmen? Tilden, I did not. Hiskek, not when he was living at your house, and they are directed to your house? Tilden, they were not directed to my house. Hiskek, they were directed to your house. Tilden, no, sir, only the fifteen Florida ones. Hiskek, did you not know that others were sent there? Tilden, sent where? Hiskek, sent to your house. Tilden, I do not think they were ever sent there. Hiskek, what makes you think they were not? Tilden, I think I should have heard of it if they had been. I have already told you those telegrams were not delivered to my house, according to the best of my knowledge and belief. Hiskek, how do you know? Tilden, I live there, and it would sometimes happen that a telegram would have come within my knowledge. Hiskek, but none of them ever did? Tilden, none of them ever did so far as I recollect or believe. Hiskek, does it not impair your certainty on that subject that you cannot tell whether or not certain telegrams were received by your private secretary which obviously came there? Might not you have had a similar lapse of memory as to these as to those directed to your private secretary? Tilden, it might have been so as to one telegram but I do not think a large number of telegrams could have come there without my knowing it. Hiskek, what were Colonel Pelton's hours? What time did he spend at your house? Tilden, he generally came in after I was abed and asleep, and generally went out before seeing me in the morning. Hiskek, generally before? Tilden, not always before. Hiskek, late to bed, and early to rise? Tilden, not always before, he was hardly ever at breakfast. Question by Reed, I will ask one other question, did there a great many telegrams come to your house, Governor Tilden? Tilden, I cannot say. Hiskek, did a great many telegrams come to your house at Gramercy Park during these days? Tilden, my impression would be there were not a great many. Hiskek, do not you know there were a great many messengers arriving constantly from the Western Union Company at your house? Tilden, I cannot remember. My impression is there did not a great many arrive. Messages to me would generally come there, messages to Pelton, were not delivered there, but went to the National Committee room. Of course I cannot undertake to say none came to him there. I should think on election night there came a good many. Chairman Hunt and I should like to ask Governor Tilden a question. 
Telegram 34, on page 17, purports to be from Marble to Colonel Peldon. According to the Tribune translation, this telegram is, Woolley asks me to say, let forces be got together immediately in readiness for contingencies either here or in Louisiana. Why do you not answer? Marble, do you know of any forces, in the sense of military forces or otherwise, that were being used, or that were ready to be used, or that there was any intention at that time to use? Dilden, no, sir, I do not. Hiskek, you knew nothing about forces in that sense? Tilden, no, sir, I thought it meant influence, friends. Hiskek, you state your belief that the returning boards in one or more states were purchased. You had information that led you to believe, and if true would convince you, that at least one of those boards offered itself for sale to the Democratic side. Tilden, it was not sold to the Democratic side, and is not the conclusion legitimate and proper, that if not purchased by one side it was by the other. Read. Oh. 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 I'll ask for the ruling of the chairman on that question. Tilden, it is a matter of logic. The chairman laughingly to read. Do you expect the chair to rule out a question he has himself asked? Read. Yes, sir. That one, with confidence. The chairman, well, he said, it is a question of logic. And as that is not a matter of investigation, I will rule out both question and answer. That is all, Governor Tilden. At the conclusion of Tilden's examination, the committee went into executive session when they decided to adjourn and return that evening to Washington. This proved to be practically the end of the cipher dispatch explosion. The men who plotted it had succeeded in disturbing the peace and domestic relations of an infirm old man for several months, they had sent forth reports vitally compromising the private as well as public character of the most eminent statesmen of the country, which reports would leave their impression upon the minds of millions of whom the evidence of his innocence would reach only thousands and an impartial posterity, to whose judgment, however, they were indifferent. Their object was accomplished. They had impaired Tilden's health, they had persuaded many that he was as unscrupulous in his political methods as Mr. Hayes had been, and to that extent fancied they had rendered him less formidable as a candidate for the presidency. Dante, who had been one of the prior or six first men of Florence, was summoned to answer a malicious charge of peculation, he was not allowed sufficient time to appear and defend himself, was condemned, as contumacious, to a heavy fine, and banished forever from his native city upon which he had conferred its greatest glory. In such company political persecution confers distinction. I will venture to close what it has seemed proper for me to say of the barbarous effort to degrade Mr. Tilden in the estimation of the world, with an entry made in my diary on Thursday the 13th of February, and four days after the examination of the Fifth Avenue Hotel. Went around yesterday to Tilden's and found him in a state of unusual irritability. He had heard that Ellis, the president of the Third National Bank, had said that Tilden and Smith we'd passed an hour in close conversation at their bank between ten and one o'clock of the day previous to Weed's departure for the South. This, if true, would convict both Tilden and Weed of perjury, for both had sworn that did not see each other between the day before the election and some time after Weed's return from the South. Weed was sent for, and this morning I met him there. Meantime the papers of the day in question were looked over in both the World and Herald show that Tilden did not go downtown that day, by accounting for all his time elsewhere. We'd also had documents to show that it was impossible for Ellis to be correct. After getting these proofs arranged and the papers marked, Tilden got into his coupe and went down to the bank. He returned about 4.30 p.m. to get me to go with him to an art reception given by the late William H. Vanderbilt, and on our way told me that if he had been a half hour later Ellis would have been gone, that when shown the papers Ellis decided to write to Cox that he had been mistaken, and that he had since been satisfied that neither Mr. Tilden nor Mr. Weed were in the bank that day. Tilden saw that letter and then came off. It is curious what devices are resorted to, to destroy this poor man's character. I was thinking this morning that no one but a man of large fortune ought to think of running for the presidency as an independent man. 
Had Tilden been a man of moderate means he would have been ruined in character long ago. But for his having files of all the daily papers for years back, and clerks to assist in searching them, he would not have been able to collect the proofs of his whereabouts on the days in question in time to stop Ellis going on to Washington, still less the wider range of proof requisite to undo Ellis' erroneous testimony after it had been given. The whole of Tilden's time, and the services of several eminent and costly lawyers and a number of clerks, have been constantly required by him since the election to defend him against the prosecutions and the persecutions of the administration. There is no prominent candidate for the presidency at present, nor ever was there one, whose income is or ever was sufficient to provide for these expenses alone. The men who will run with the machine, who will for combinations with rings and treat with the baser elements of society, have no such friction to contend with. Those baser elements stand ready to provide all the means necessary for their instruments. But when a man antagonizes rings, refuse to make bargains or to give promises, provokes the hostility of all the selfish interests which thrive under a corrupt government only, he has to contend with an amount of feebleness and acquiescence on the part of the class who profess to desire good government and a hostility from those who prefer a bad one, which will crush anyone who cannot a moment's notice put his hand upon almost unlimited resources. Early in 1877 a report was put into circulation in Washington that Mr. Tilden or his friends had been negotiating for the exemption of his bank account from inspection by the Investigating Committee of Congress. Justly indignant at such an imputation, he addressed the following letter to Senator Kernan, the last sentence of which betrays the perfidious origin of the report. Governor Tilden to Senator Kernan, New York. February 21, 1877. The Honorable Francis Kernan, Washington, D.C. A telegram to the Associated Press, published this morning, states that a harmonious agreement had been brought about between the Senate Committee, of which you are a member, and a Committee of the House, by which it has been decided not to go into an examination of my back account on the one hand, or the accounts of the Chairman of the Republican National Committee on the other hand. I repudiate any such agreement, and disclaim any such immunity, protection, or benefit from it. I reject the utterly false imputation that my private bank account contains anything whatever that needs to be concealed. Under the pretense of looking for payment in December, the demand was for all payments after May and all deposits during the nine months. The bank was repeatedly menaced with the removal of its officers and books to Washington. A transcript of entries of private business, trusts, and charities, containing everything but what the committee was commissioned to investigate, but nothing which it was commissioned to investigate, because nothing of that sort existed, has been taken, with my knowledge, to Washington. Of course there is no item in it relating to anything in Oregon, for I never made, authorized, or knew of any expenditure in relation to the election in that state or the resulting controversies, or any promise or obligation on the subject. Mr. Ellis, the acting president of the bank, himself a Republican. Some time ago told the chairman of the committee and several of its members, that there is nothing in the account capable of furthering any just object of the investigation. I am also informed that a resolution was passed to summon me as a witness, but have received no subpoena. I had written before this telegram appeared, requesting you to say to the committee that it would be more agreeable to me not to visit Washington if the committee would send a subcommittee or hold session here, but that otherwise I should attend under the subpoena. As to this arrangement now reported, I have only to say that I can accept decorum and decency. But not a fictitious equivalent for a mantle of secrecy to anybody else. S. J. Tilden. This concludes Chapter 6. Please leave comments, like and subscribe.